Hi, I'm Amanda. And I'm Jessica. And this is, oh, let's start over. Get home from school, turn on my TV. Who are these friends staring right back at me? Now that we're older, why don't you come over and go back in time with me? Hi, I'm Amanda. And I'm Jessica, and this is 90s Babies Nostalgia, where two fully grown millennial women rewatch and sometimes watch for the first time iconic tween entertainment from the early 2000s. Just to be clear, we are not sponsored by nor affiliated with any of the brands, shows, actors, anything that we're talking about in this podcast. We just really like talking about TV. And today, the TV that we are talking about is The Sweet Life. Sweet. Of Zach and Zach Cody. And Cody. Season, season two, two, part four, if you can believe it. This season has 39 episodes, and we are not covering all of them. We're not. I feel like we're not even covering that many of them. It's like 15 in total. Like we're around half, not half, less than half. But we covered them. There's just so much to di- dissect in each one. Mm-hmm. Big. So in this episode, we are going to be discussing episodes 30, 31, 36, and 37. Um, If you want to uh, pause and go watch those to get the context and come back. Mm -hmm. And then we will have one more episode covering season two before we make it to the final frontier. Yeah. Which Amanda started to watch and texted me last night and was like, season three feels like a wildly different show. So I'm very excited to get into season three. We had this experience with Lizzie and maybe a little bit with, no, not with Lizzie. We had it with Raven. Yeah, we had it a little bit with season two, even. It started to feel like a different show. Yeah, I was going to say, it's funny that Disney does that, but I'm excited to kind of see how it changes. Mm -hmm. What have you been watching listening to enjoying loving liking i have a song recommendation this time i don't even know how to give a song recommendation but um it's not a new song it's been out for like a year it's just new to me (laughs) (laughs) it's called worth it by ray spelled r-a-y-e and it's very like old school vibey it's a little upbeat a little jazzy but I enjoy it because it's a love song, but it's about, like, I could love you if you're going to make it worth it for all this, like, time I could be spending on myself that I'm spending on you. And it just feels like a love song that's not um, not too gushy and not discrediting that you are the prize. Mm. So it makes me feel upbeat, and I like dancing around to it. Oh, and I like I that. Just, I just like I'm I'm in the mood for songs that make me feel confident and empowered and like I can dance around. Is it pop? It's poppy, yeah. Okay. It's hard to I I don't know what genre I would say that it is. Okay. I can listen <laughs> to it. <laughs> what have you been enjoying lately? It, truly I was at loss at first of things, but something that I have been enjoying, um, is one of our podcast friends, Pop Capsule Pod. Um, if you're not familiar, they basically go over like iconic pop culture moments that happened 10 and 20 years ago for each week throughout the year. And 2004 just has some like really, really amazing nostalgic moments. Um, and so recently they've been going over a lot of Grammy stuff. And then in this most recent episode, it was um, Super Bowl. And 2004 Super Bowl was Justin Timberlake, mm. Janet Jackson, that whole thing. And to hear it from a 20 years later perspective, um, they're just so funny. And it's such a good podcast. Um, but I'm really, really especially enjoying the content this year just because the moments feel so like ingrained in my brain. It's fun to listen to people chat about it. 
So you sh- if you like us, you should definitely go give Pop Capsule Pod a listen because they are amazing. And I think like very similar. It's two best friends from high school, um, you know, now grown talking about pop cu- culture. So yeah, I love the um, Pop Capsule 90s baby synergy. It's like mm-hmm. every six months or so, one of us has to mention the other. Yeah. yeah. I felt like it was um, – it was time. It was time. And I've been listening every single week so far this year. I've been listening to it. So I'm like, they deserve it. Getting into it. Starting with episode 30, mm-hmm. Club Twin. Zach and Cody want to go to this local teen club, which is something I totally forgot was a thing and I was confused about growing up as well. But they can't afford it. So instead, they pitch to Mosby that they're going to open their own nightclub at the Tipton in the lounge because there's nothing going on on Monday nights anyway. And they give this whole presentation about how they're going to make money. And Mosby's like on the fence. But if they'll make money, uh, we'll try it out. We'll try it out. And so he gives them 60 bucks for snacks and balloons. But opening night is a flop. Their friends (laughs) show up. Bob, Barbara, Max, Agnes. Agnes. Those are the people who show up, and even they dip. They're like, oh, uh, awkward. So Zach's like, all right, I'm taking charge of this, because I think most of the planning before was Cody and Maddie for monetary reasons. So Zach pulls a classic club move. Next week is ladies' night. Ladies Mm -hmm. get in free, which means all the desperate guys are going to line up down the block, and that's what happens. And we get a line out the door of the Tipton. It's popping, and Mosby comes by the next day to be like, here's your bills, because they paid. They they needed to pay him. They had a lot of energy going on, a lot of music and drinks and lights. But you know what? Zach can cover, because that's how much of a success it was. He hands him cold, hard cash, and Mosby's like, wow maybe um do you want to do this on tuesdays too and carrie's like tuesdays are my nights Mm -hmm. just think about it just think about it next week is 60s night zach's going full theme and he's like people have the outfits on they book go-go dancers and they've booked a band and Mm -hmm. both of them were in their prime in the actual 60s these Mm -hmm. are Old lady go-go dancers who kind of have it going on. Yeah, truly. And they're friends with the old man band who are like, hey, haven't seen those ladies in a while. But then the old men are dressed as pirates and they kind of set fire to the stage. It starts smoking. It's not really a fire, but it's confusing and everyone runs out. Yeah, he like tries to smash his guitar, but instead of smashing it forward, he falls backwards, and then there's smoke everywhere. Yeah, so then they have to pay Mosby the $400 that they made for the damages, and they get shut down. He tells them that they're going to have to scrub pots and pans to make up the rest. And Zach's really disappointed, but Cody's like, hey, man, I had a great experience with my bro. Mm Mm-hmm. And then you wrote this extra line that I did not catch, but apparently Zach wants to dip into Cody's savings for his newest franchise, Glow in the Dark Pizza. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did not catch that part. Zach's an entrepreneur. He's always thinking about the uh, next, next biggest and hottest thing. He is. I kind of feel like this is the start of him becoming a little more like Corey Baxter in the like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. interested in the money. Yeah. Yeah, slightly less like he's already rich because he's always going to Cody's savings where like Corey just like secretly was so good at saving money. But yes, I do think the kind of like what's the next hot thing that can make me a lot of cash. Yeah. It it creates her some interesting plot lines, so I'm into it. Um, B plot, London is getting her own line of cosmetics – And she is, like, talking to Maddie about this. And she's like, I don't know what to call it. And she suggests something like good hair or, like, good face. (laughs) (laughs) Something like that. And Maddie's like, how about Simply London? And she's like, oh, my God, that's so great. That's what we're going to call it. Um, And then she comes back. She has a perfume. She's like, London, you have to try – or Maddie, you have to try this. It makes the boys go crazy. 
London spraying it on her. All the men in the lobby are flocking to her. She sprays it on a chair. They flock to the chair. Smiley's like, oh my God, I need that. And it works. And she loves it. And then London comes back with a big bag of products for her to try. And then later on, we see London come back with even more products for Maddie. And Maddie's like hiding behind the candy counter. And she pops up and she has like pink frizzy hair. Her skin is pink. She has big, giant, inflamed ears. Oh my God, they're so big. Her lips are swollen. (laughs) Her lips are swollen. She's kind of looking like a troll doll came to life. And... London's like, what happened? Was that my, like, cosmetic line? And Maddie's like, did you test these on anyone? She's like, yeah, you. Mm. And that's that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are in any, like, particular order, but for a plot, I thought it was funny you kind of mentioned this, the whole ladies' night thing. This is just, like, such a common tactic that all clubs, especially in Vegas, use it's just like oh get the women to come in for free yeah i think most clubs not that i am a a club goer i actually have not been to a club since october of 2018 the fact that i know that is a little bit sad however i do know that the clubs that i went to in college most of them had a ladies night once a week but it wasn't a free night it was like a half off Oh, so when you're a broke college that. kid, you're like, I still have to pay. Yeah, it's a little annoying, but the tactic does work. So it does. Also, there's this part where when Zach is like planning like the 60s night before it becomes a failure, he's talking about like, oh, we're going to do like a night in Paris and all these things for like the upcoming Mondays. And Cody's mm-hmm. like, whoa, 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 don't get ahead of yourself. Like, let's focus one week on at a time. And, like, Cody's being, like, quite hard on Zach for being, like, creative and planning ahead. And I'm like, Cody, you haven't even helped at all. Like, <laughs> I think so Zach like, kind of stopped from, from helping, though. Yeah. Yeah, I still felt like Cody was being a little tough on Zach. For the fact that, like, Cody, I don't know, there was a lot of times that I felt like he was like, oh, yes, our club night. And I'm like, you've done nothing. (laughs) Yeah. I also thought it was just a little, I think the sentiment was Cody didn't want to do too much too soon because he didn't want to be spending money preemptively. But I did kind of feel like, isn't it smart to plan? Like, a week is not a lot of time to plan. Not if you're trying to get, like, bands and dancers and entertainment like you need to plan that shit in advance exactly i really enjoyed this like we didn't mention it but there's these weird ass interactions between bob and barbara at the club because bob is their bartender he's serving out soda and barbara's never had soda before and there's this she keeps being like hit me again like like it's a real bar and when she first is like I don't know I've never had it before he's like I drink it all the time and I'm great I haven't slept in three days and it's just like a weird little recurring interaction which I also forgot to mention when I was doing the summary that at one point she's so hopped up on sugar that she kisses Cody which is the first time we see that kind of interaction i believe Mm -hmm. it's just like a weird little playful thing but i like getting more of the friends anyway so yeah i did like that this main plot involved like we had agnes we had max like we kind of had everyone there and it just makes the like time watching it go by way faster and it's just fun to see them all together and interact in the way that they like toss lines back at one another like it's just yeah it makes Mm -hmm. the episodes more enjoyable when we have the friend group i think but speaking of max cast allison stoner and make her dance yep literally like that's all they ever do they're like is she on screen then she's got to be dancing i think there's been one single episode i've seen her in where she was not dancing yeah because this one max shows up to the club 
on ladies night and Zach is like, go dance with all the guys because then they're going to get thirsty and buy more drinks. So, Mm -hmm. but like the way that she's dancing is like, like her music video dancing. Like it's like hip hop. It's not like people can't dance with you. No, absolutely. Actually not. It's more like get everyone in a circle and make them watch you dance is the vibe. Yeah. If they're getting thirsty, it's from cheering. <laughs> Another note of mine is that when Mosby comes up for with the bills, because he comes up very early in the morning, Carrie's like all grumpy, and she says something like, whatever the boys did, just know that I cannot be liable for it. That's entirely factually inaccurate. These are minors. You're their mother. You are their legal representative in every way, shape, and form. They would not go to jail or have to pay any fines. And by jail, I even mean juvie. Like, like if they damaged the hotel, you are entirely liable, Carrie. Yeah. You and the hotel, depending on the yeah. insurance situation. Well, and it wasn't written into the plot, so this is just me, like, inferring, but when Mosby knocks on the door, she's, like, half wing. She's like, I had a late night last night, and she was giving me slightly hungover vibes, so I was like, was that just, like, them, you know, that was the vibe I was getting was that she was hungover, so I'm like, okay, if someone's hungover, you would be like, nope, whatever they did, I'm not liable, talk to them, leave me alone, like... I'm not in this. So that was kind of the energy she was giving to me. But yes, you are right. Factually, she would be liable. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was funny. It was a good little exchange. It just, I was just like, that's not true. Um, And speaking of things that are not true, we get this fun little tidbit that apparently when they were five, Zach convinced Cody that if he ate his toenails, he'd grow a foot in his stomach. You know, that's a pretty good thing. If my parents tried to convince me that when I was young, I feel like I'd believe them. I think I'd start eating my toenails. You want a foot in your stomach? I think it'd be a fun experiment. Mm. A foot's not as big as a watermelon, so it feels less dangerous. That's true. That's true. But I I was just amused by it because I've never heard that before. I've only heard the watermelon thing. I've never heard someone say you're going to grow a foot in your tummy. How original, Zach. You really are the smart one. Yeah. Yes. The writers... um. We're doing good this episode, I feel. B-plot? I just have to comment. This isn't really a B-plot. This is just general. I noticed in this, like, second half of season two, Mm -hmm. I feel like Maddie is going through a hair transformation. She Mm -hmm. had some interesting hairstyles. She wore it straight a lot. It kind of was the one note. But also, this is very fitting that we're now around, like, what, 2006, maybe early 2007 when these episodes came out? Yeah, seven, I think. Yeah. Um, That is when, like, the salt spray beach wave moment was, like, at its peak. We all wanted beachy waves. And Maddie is really rocking the beachy waves quite a few episodes. And I am here for it. I like them. I think they look pretty um i'm into it and it's just given early aughts in a way that i enjoy i agree her hair is either absolutely atrocious she's got the bumpets she's got the like she color does chalk. wear a bump it a lot she's got the like strips of different colors which are either clipped in or chalk both of which i tried in middle school She's got the crimping going on in various places. She's got giant ass pigtails that have like very regularly she's got twice the amount of hair that naturally comes out of her head, which I wouldn't (laughs) normally judge, but she's someone who has like naturally thinner hair. So it's just very apparent. Well, even these beach waves, I would say two thirds of that hair is not her hair, but I'm still here (laughs) for it. (laughs) But yeah, then sometimes they really get it right. And when they do, I'm like, that's right. She does look pretty and normal. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) One of the products that London gives Maddie to try, which results in the overly giant ears, is ear cream. And Maddie's like, ear cream. And London's like, yeah, for chapped ears. And like, I guess unless you live, like, where it's snowing, but then you would Mm -hmm. wear hats. Like, who's getting chapped ears? Sunburnt ears. Yes, that happens. But chapped ears? 
Yeah, unless you're like a sled dog guy. <laughs> Musher, is that what they're called? Uh, <laughs> sure, sure. But that's a very specific. Yeah, I'm aware. (laughs) I'm aware. I don't think that anyone listens to her. I mean, maybe Mallory from Pop Capsule Pod. She's up in Manitoba. Um, Yeah. (laughs) No, no, I agree. It's ridiculous. Like, you'd have to live somewhere with really bad wind chill. Really, really bad wind chill. And oh, no hats. Yeah, I don't like hats personally. Oh. Okay, I'm into like a beanie for warmth. My my one note on the that plot is that the look that she gives when she comes out in full like pink. You kind of mentioned it's like a trolls doll come to life. She looks like Alessia Rulin's character Natalie in Halloween Town High. Mm. Alessia Rulin is Kelsey, the actress that plays Kelsey in High School Musical. If you need a mm-hmm. face to think of, she plays a a beauty pageant troll in Halloween Town High. It's the third one that most of the time because they're in their human skins looks like kelsey essentially but then when she dehuman skins she's a big furry pink troll with like this great brilliant Mm. hair and face paint everywhere and sparkles and glitter and she looks fabulous this Mm -hmm. is giving that but bad yeah i just looked at photos your description is spot on because it looks it's even like the same shade of pink i think it's like it's like someone used the same makeup and costuming but then just like fucked it up (laughs) yeah she's like pink and has huge giant hair but is like cute Cute. and fun and i want to be her friend and like if i saw maddie i'd be like we need to get as humanly far away as possible from that human right now because like they're unhinged and maybe something bad's gonna happen (laughs) but also maddie was so bad that i like if i saw that in person i wouldn't think that that was an allergic reaction because it looked like makeup because it was like so oh yeah anyway (laughs) some quotes some quotes Um, When they're spraying their perfume around the lobby and they spray it on the chair and all the boys in the lobby flock to the chair and start like smelling it. At one point, a guy even like picks up the chair and carries it out the front door of the lobby, which I was shocked Mr. Mosby was um, not shutting that down. (laughs) But um, either Maddie or London says that, but they're like, and that chair doesn't even have nice legs. Mm -hmm. And I liked it. Um, and then during Sixties Night, when Cody's like questioning Zach, being like, "You're already planning ahead. Like, let's just focus one week at a time." Um, Zach's like, "Don't bring me down, bro. You're turning my mood ring blue." <laughs> <laughs> what a throwback! Mood rings. Why do mm-hmm. I kind of want one? I know, but also again, I feel like that was like a '90s thing, maybe early aughts, but more like '90s thing. Not a 60s thing, but that's okay. Maddie, at the end, somehow she gets, like, knocked over on the floor when she's looking like a troll. And um, Mosby comes in, and he's like, security, clown down in the lobby. And it's just poor Maddie. That was funny. My one is Agnes Likes, because... Mm -hmm. I don't know if she said it in the election episode. She might have, but this was the first one where I wrote it down as a quote because that's like her catchphrase and it's kind of creepy, kind of gross, very indicative of the times. And despite being kind of creepy and kind of gross, I don't really hate it. It's just kind of, it's, I think coming out of a young girl, I don't mind it as much as when it comes out of a young boy. I don't know why. Yeah, I agree. I think it would be better if we just weren't saying it at all, but it feels less icky coming out of a young girl. One hundo. Episode 31. Risk it all. Um, Guest stars in this one. We have Dan Levy as Jerry Barnes. At first, I was really stoked when I read that because I thought it was the Canadian Dan Levy because I wrote these down before I watched the episodes. Um, and I was really upset to learn that it's the American comedian Dan Levy, but still important to note. I only know the one. Schitt's Creek? That's the one I know. Oh, I yeah, don't know Canadian. the American one. Oh, he's like a pretty popular comedian. 
I thought you were saying you didn't know the Canadian one. And I, I was know. Like, <laughs> I was like, how? Summary. Our plot. Zach and Cody are at home watching this game show called Risk It All. And Cody knows all the answers to the questions. And Zach's like, you know what? If we went on the show, we would win the grand prize. Like, you are so smart. And I could do all the physical challenges. And we'd be a great duo. So they ask Carrie because they're like, the show chooses contestants from the live studio audience. Like, let's go watch an episode. And Carrie was like, "Mm, I'm not so sure about that. And then she learns the grand prize is a trip to Hawaii. She's like, count me in. Let's go, boys. Also, Cody tells Zach that everyone's mistake is risking it all instead of leaving when they're ahead. Like when they have like seven prizes, they choose always choose to risk it all. Um, and so they go to the game show. They're dressed as Elvis. Amanda said that this was important to the plot, but I thought it was. Um, and <laughs> they're trying to get attention of the host. And so... Cody's like being Cody and dorky and doing bird calls. And the host is like, the fuck? And so Zach goes and pants is Cody. um, And it's like, see, we're willing to risk it all. And he's like, great. And then they get selected. They're starting out. The first prize is an HD DVD player. (laughs) And Cody's crushing it. Um, The physical challenge is Zach has to deliver sushi to this woman Um, but has to get through a sumo wrestler and then they move on to the next round and it's a baseball related round. So Zach immediately answers the question and Cody's like, I thought we agreed that you were doing all the physical challenges because the way it works is whoever answers the question, the other person has to do the physical challenge. So Cody has to like hit a balloon through a hole, except the like bat that he is given is like it's giving me the thing you use to clean your pool but without pool net. net yeah it's but pool net, net without the pool okay. net yeah <laughs> it's a pool net without the net so they're like winning a bunch of prizes and they stick to their original plan cody answers the questions zach does the challenges they got atvs they got mountain bikes they got season tickets to the red Sox and matching jet skis and now they are on their way to do the grand prize for Hawaii. And Zach is feeling really, really tired. And Cody just speaks up and interrupts and is like, we're going to risk it all. Cody has to spell T-Rex, which I did not even try to spell it in our document because I could never. Like Tyrannosaurus Rex, to be clear. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Not T-R-E-X. Cody crushes that. He does it. Now it's all up to Zach to win. Otherwise, they lose all their prizes. And Zach has to spell dog. But there are these giant, like, wooden block letters that he has to, like, stack on top of a doghouse while going through an obstacle course. Mm -hmm. Um, And at the last moment, the D topples off the top. He only spelled Og, and they lose. And Carrie's, like, very, very upset. And they have a consolation prize, which, of course, is a two-night stay at the Tipton. Mm -hmm. Um... And Zach's upset because he's like, Cody, you got greedy. Like you always said that, you know, the biggest thing is that people risk it all when they shouldn't. And that's exactly what we did. Um, And Carrie kind of like assures him. It's like, you know what? Even though she's really upset about not being able to go to Hawaii, she's like, it's just a game show. She does, but I don't feel like she means it. Yeah. Yeah. I got the impression that she was more upset than the boys. Mm. Yeah, she was pretty, like, inappropriately upset. (laughs) (laughs) B-plot is that Maddie's clocking out, so Mosby tells her that actually she needs to stay late because her candy counter is a mess, and she's upset about this. Esteban comes over and he's like, yeah, that Mosby's being a real jerk these days, and they're both just venting to each other. And to feel better, Maddie drafts an email that is a letter to Mosby telling her all the ways that she is upset with him and how he's a big meanie pants. 
and it's not supposed to be sent, but she's telling London and Esteban about it. And she's like, I just feel so much better. And London hits send because she had to get rid of the email to look at her website. So because London sent it, what do they have to do? They have to get into Mosby's account to delete it. So London is lookout. And she is a shitty lookout, so they convince Mosby that there's a rat, a wet rat on a fire running from the, on fire, on fire. running from the basement to the roof, hope, mm-hmm. hoping that will keep Mosby out of his office while Maddie and Esteban try to get into his computer because he does have a password and it is currently locked. They're, like, rummaging through all his stuff, trying to see if he wrote his password down somewhere and all of the photos he has because he has photos of himself from, what, all of his employee of the month photos or something? Yeah, I'm not really sure, but, yeah, it's, like, photos over time of him, like, all hanging up. There's, like, a lot of them. There's, like, 16 of them or something, and Mm -hmm. they all fall down while they're rummaging for his password, so now... Maddie's trying to get into the email while Esteban is, like, trying to fix the photos. Mosby comes in, doesn't catch them because they jump down under the desk and hide there. And London's just like, I'm rich, and walks away. And (laughs) Maddie, like, makes a little feeling on Mosby's leg, like, so he thinks it's a rat and he leaves. Mm Mm-hmm. But because he was just in his office, he had logged into his email, so she was able to successfully delete the email. And then on their way out, all the photos fall again because there's actually no – there's no nails on this wall, guys. And no. Esteban and Maddie quickly try to put the photos up. Next time we see them, they're at the candy counter, and Mosby is walking up to them, and he is quoting the email at them because what happened he read it on his cell phone before they were able to delete it that's right 2007 we're reading emails on our cell phones i didn't realize we mm-hmm. had that technology already but mr tipton pays the big bucks mm-hmm. and maddie kind of explains like i didn't mean to send that and like i don't feel that way i was just like frustrated and most people oddly understanding and then mm-hmm. says like just tell me next time and also don't send an email like this. And also don't ever go in my office again. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Bit of a beefy episode. Yeah. For sure a beefy episode. Also an episode that I remember clearly. I feel like this one was on the reruns. Um, because I definitely have watched it at least 15 times. It's one of the more memorable ones to me. But it didn't hit me as much as it did you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I really remembered this one. I wanted to address the uh, just from the beginning that this feels like a parody of the Nickelodeon show I've never seen Double Dare to my recollection have you seen Double Dare Mm -mm. there's in the er the late 90s and the early aughts like before they transitioned to more scripted stuff there were one or two Nickelodeon shows that were like game shows for kids but i haven't seen that since and i haven't heard of it since i mostly know about it from nickelodeon documentaries so i just thought it was really interesting that disney rather than having their own game show had this like parody nickelodeon type game show yeah interesting because otherwise like when is there a game show with kid contestants yeah yeah And it was originally aired in the 80s, which is even, like, I don't know, more interesting to me. Yeah, Double Dare was on for a while. I think there was another one as well, but that's – Double Dare is the one I remember the most. Yeah. You wrote this about the host. Yeah. Like, the host stick is, like, his whole thing is he just is like, all right, you freaks. And he's, like, Mm -hmm. just refers to everyone as freaks, which, like, I don't like in general, but I especially – don't like it when it's to an entire audience of kids yeah i hate this man i repeatedly wrote i hate this guy because he's awful he's not entertaining and the one way he tries to make people laugh like you said is calling them freaks and he does it in a way that is malicious it's not like Mm -hmm. oh my god you're such a freak it's like 
you freaks. Ha <laughs> ha. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. It's very laughy at people. It's mean and I don't like him. Yeah, it's very like shooting at people when they're already down because he does it at moments normally where people are failing or have done something embarrassing, which like makes it even worse. And then it goes back. We've mentioned it before, but it like if you're watching a TV show and you're seeing this and everyone's laughing at it, then it's teaching people that like you can just go around and call people freaks. And I'm like, Carrie, let Zach and Cody watch this. Like, I would, if I had children, I would not let them watch this game show if that was the host's whole thing. It's mean. I agree. During the first challenge, Zach has to deliver sushi by getting through a sumo wrestler. (laughs) And he, like, fully just, like, at first, just, like, runs straight into the sumo wrestler. I don't know what he thought would happen there. Um... But when he does that, he, like, bounces off the sumo wrestler and none of the sushi goes flying off the plate. And I'm like, that clearly was a proper, everything was glued down. But it was, like, it just looked so unrealistic. I thought one or two pieces fell off his tray before he made it to the end. No. I'm I'm pretty sure. No, the only piece that got off of his tray is the one that he grabbed to throw that he used as a distraction. Oh, uh, also, mm-hmm. ooh, I did not realize he used one as a distraction. That's problematic as hell. Yeah, that's how like he, he got through. Yes. Like he threw problem. it and the sumo wrestler chased after it. Um, Was more distracted looking at it. Didn't He didn't move and chase after it, but then because he was distracted watching the sushi, Zach okay. cr- crawled through his legs. Okay, which, that's yeah. that's better than what I was interpreting that as. Yeah, I it's did in still general a problem. Even when I thought that sushi fell off the plate, I still was like, more should have fallen off. All of it should have fallen I, off. Well, he, like, I know. Bounced back like four feet. Um. Also, the boys are so excited about the idea of ATVs when it comes up. What the hell are two? Teenage boys that live in a hotel in Boston, like Mm -hmm. even if they didn't live in a hotel, they still live in Boston doing with two ATVs. Where are you storing them? I also wanted to know. I also wanted to know. (laughs) Like Maybe Arwen would keep them, but hmm. you know, also knowing them there, they would just like drive them around the hallways. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They would. But why is Carrie, like, happy that they're getting these things? Because what does she think is going to happen with them when they live in a hotel in Boston? And the jet skis. At least an ATV, you can drive in places that are inappropriate. A jet ski, you have to have a vehicle large enough to transport to a large body of water before you can use it. Yeah, a lot of these um, prizes didn't make sense. Yeah, the ATVs and the jet skis really got me. Um, also, Carrie is so upset about not going to Hawaii. She's like, this was my dream. I've always wanted to go to Hawaii. Mm-hmm. But I'm pretty sure. I don't remember the exact location. But during that weird Christmas episode when the blizzard happened, she was supposed to go on a solo vacation to like Fiji or Tahiti or something. So I'm like, you take yourself on solo vacations. Just go to Hawaii, girl. Like, what are you doing? Why are you so upset? I think she's going to Mexico. Like, I feel like she's going to, like, Cancun. Mm, I felt like it was somewhere more tropical than that. Okay, if it's Mexico, then she's allowed to be upset. But if it was somewhere more tropical, I'm like, clearly you have the ability to afford a solo vacation like that. Just take yourself to Hawaii. Yeah, and the time from Boston to Mexico would be comparable to the time from Boston to Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Anywho, I agree. If she can go on vacation, she can go to Hawaii. Not that mm-hmm. we should be going to Hawaii because the tourism industry is actually really taxing on Hawaii and the locals discourage people going there, which makes me sad because I would love to go. But ethically, I don't. Also, I financially, can't afford it. Yeah. I really like the role reversal in this episode. Mm. Did you write this note or did I write this note? I feel like I wrote this note. I think you wrote this note, but I definitely had this thought. Yeah, I liked this episode and the little role reversal of Zach is normally the one that would take the big risks and not give a crap. But Cody is the one in this episode that is like getting way too wrapped up in it. 
and goes a little too hard in the show. Mm -hmm. And I also like that similarly the physical strength is valued in this storyline the same as the book smarts because usually I don't find those are balanced as so well. But it was Mm -hmm. like, you know, Zach was just as important as Cody. The whole thing of why they had to be careful was that even if Zach could answer an occasional question, Cody couldn't do the physical Mm -hmm. challenges the way that Zach could. And it was Mm -hmm. him being overworked and too tired that was their downfall. So I liked Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and like Zach or Cody not listening to Zach when Zach was like expressing feelings of exhaustion and not being able to like move forward and questioning it where normally it I feel like it's the opposite. <laughs> Cody is expressing feelings and Zach is not listening. So uh-huh. yeah, it, it was really lovely to kind of see the role reversal, especially that it came out in times under pressure where it's like, yeah, when we are under pressure, sometimes we do act differently. So it felt very like true as well. It didn't feel like weird or off for their characters. It made the role reversal made sense. Mm hmm. Uh, quick side note, why do we have more Japanese stuff? This is maybe the third episode. This is the third episode we have personally discussed. Yeah. About just from this season that has had something Japanese in it. We had the feng shui yep. plot. We had the Japanese opera singer. And now uh-huh. we have this like where there's obviously multiple challenges but only a couple of them get the highlight and this is like the biggest one in the beginning with the Mm -hmm. sumo wrestler and the supposedly japanese woman that he has to give the sushi to who actually doesn't look japanese no at all she looks very like south asian Mm -hmm. yeah um i just why but also early aughts i guess we we did have a thing huh was this the rise of the weebs (laughs) <laughs> what the fuck is a weeb? <laughs> a weeaboo. <laughs> you don't know what a weeaboo is? <laughs> no, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh. A, weeab- a weeaboo, colloquially known as a weeb, is uh-huh. a white person obsessed, usually white, can be non Japanese person, usually a Western person, obsessed yeah. with Japanese culture. Typically, this manifests in um, anime and or manga, 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 anime, a little bit like JRPGs and Pokemon and stuff like that. And they start like maybe they learn a little bit of Japanese or maybe they start collecting katanas and just like, you know, those white guys with the ponytails and the swords in their houses. The, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, a weeb, even if you don't know yeah. what they're called. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I feel it was 2007 was kind of rise of the weeb. Was it not? Yeah. No, I think you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Even though I didn't know what that was. Yes. <laughs> uh okay next note the cgi on the ball deflating and flying around because cody does successfully do that physical challenge at the Mm -hmm. nick of time it it's like a balloon type thingy but or a ball i thought it was a ball but then he hits it and it like deflates and it flies around the room like nutso and then into the hole and it, it pissed me off it's terrible cgi and also there's no way in hell that its trajectory would just like randomly go all over the place and then right directly into the hole didn't like it Mm -hmm. i feel like if you see it as a balloon it makes more sense because balloons do kind of like you know and go all over the place but still it would not go in the way that it did no (laughs) the odds of that happening nil yeah and my last and final note on plot a is we get orlando bloom reference number 74 in this episode it's not 74 i'm not counting but it's at least four We've been referencing him since the very first episode. London has a history of the Orlando Bloom incident and being a Crazy Stalker fan. And in one of the physical challenges, Zach is wrestling with a very large German-ish woman and distracts her by saying, oh, look, Orlando Bloom. And I just, Mm. I said, I don't know why, but I do know why, but it's lazy. And the reason I know why is this is 2007. This is, I checked, that's the same year the second Pirates movie came out. Mm. Disney was like, we making money, we making references, and that's going to also come up 
in the next episodes of recovering. Ha 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 ha. We'll throw away. I just, I don't know. It feels lazy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, My notes on B-Plot is the moment that Mosby is lecturing Maddie about how her candy stock is all out of whack and the expiration dates don't make sense. And the candy that expires first should be in the front. And the candy that expires the latest should be in the back. And my brain immediately was like, FIFO, 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 which is like the first thing that they teach you whenever you work in any sort of job where you have to stock things or order things. Um, it's first in, first out. Oh, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. I was thinking during that exchange, she is an hourly worker. You cannot legally keep her. She has clocked out. Oh, yeah, she would have to clock back in. Also, they would not pay her overtime to move no. some candy to the front. Like, they're exactly. just not, that didn't make sense. Um, the work frustration email is so real. Um, but the key to that is always delete the two. Even, honestly, if you're typing any sort of long or hard email, my biggest recommendation is, like, just delete whoever you're sending it to while you work through it so you're never accidentally sending an email. Um because I feel like it happens way more often. Like, obviously, you're not making huge mistakes of, like, sending that level of email to someone on accident. Or at least I would hope not. But, like, all of us have accidentally sent an email before it was ready to go. It's so, like, just delete the two until it's ready. Yeah, I regularly start by filling in the two. And then I'll be typing. And I'm like, I actually don't know if this is making any sense. And I'm just, like, very n- nervous that maybe I'll accidentally, because I have a very sensitive trackpad on my work computer, I might accidentally send it. So then I just delete it. Mm-hmm. And I'll fill it in later. Mm-hmm. Stresses me out. Mm-hmm. Do you write your passwords down? Um, Like, no. No, I don't. Yeah, because it just felt very dated. It's a, it's still a thing that people try to use in TV, but I feel like lots of people in the beginning were like, write your passwords down in like the early aughts when we started having a bunch of passwords. And then after that, they were like, don't write them down because if you write them down, someone's going to find them and break into your stuff. Mm-hmm. But for them looking for a written down password for Mosby makes sense to me. That doesn't feel dated. It makes sense that Mosby would write down his passwords. Now, would Maddie write down hers? Probably not. That's true. I wasn't really thinking of it as unrealistic as much as I was just like, LOL, I've never. I I have one post-it. Oh, my God, don't bring into my home and find my passwords. But I have one tiny little half-size post-it <laughs> that has my passwords <laughs> to the few accounts that have, like, genuinely unique passwords that, like, if I can't get into them, I will be in serious trouble, namely my mm. bank account. Oh, my mm. God. Don't find the post-it. I totally <laughs> actually leave it lying around all the time, and it's a big problem because if I lose it, that is not great. Um but yeah, no, aside from that, I've never been one to write my passwords down. Quotes! Mm-hmm. Mr. Mosby to Esteban goes, Esteban scraped the gum off Mrs. Hamilton's shoe, which I just have to say, Esteban, you do not have to do that. That is not in your job duties as a bellman. You can refuse. Um. Also, <laughs> oh no, I think you wrote this one down. I did. Uh, I wrote the others down. While Maddie is trying to guess passwords, Esteban suggests that maybe the password is Esteban is the most handsome employee in the hotel. Mm -hmm. And she just looks at him and he's like, well, it's true. But I thought it was fun. Mm -hmm. While Cody is doing the physical challenge in uh, Risk It All, Carrie is cheering him on from the audience and she goes, you can do it, honey. And then she turns to the person next to her and says, he can't do it. Yeah. (laughs) And then uh, part of the, like, photograph figuring out aligning thing is the way that they're, like, referring to them is by the hairstyles. So the whole episode is Esteban's trying to put the photographs back up in the order that they were supposed to be. He and Maddie would be guessing, referencing them by, like, the fro or the fade and then how they find out. How that Mosby knows that they were in his office is he as he's walking away he's like by the way it's afro jerry curl then fade mm-hmm. interesting yeah. mm-hmm. i amuse me 
Okay, guys, I know we're close to an hour, but bear with us because we are going into a massive two-parter. And by massive, I mean not that big of a deal, actually. I kind of forgot that it existed. It's episodes 36 and 37, The Sweet Life Goes Hollywood. Yeah, we're going to cover part one first, but we're going to cover both in this episode. But part one, episode 36, a few of the guest stars we get in this one. We have Dante Basco who as Madrid, which is like the Hollywood version of London. Um, he was the voice actor for uh, Prince Zuko in Avatar, as well as Jake Long in American Dragon, Jake Long. Um, we get Rich Carell as the TV director. Not very, like, that notable of a name, except that it was the Sweet Life director himself. So I thought mm. that was important that he also acted in these episodes. Um, Sam McMurray as Bud, um, who's in Drop Dead Jer- Gorgeous, but literally guested on every single show. All of the shows, he was a guest on it. If you could think of the show, he probably guested on it. Um, and he did a fair amount of voice acting as well. And then Brecken and Bridger Palmer, who were the Hollywood Zack and Cody's in this episode, um, they were in yours, mine's, mine and ours. And then Josh Sussman is, he's credited as copy guy. He is also one of the other guy's kids. But the yeah, Josh Sussman, I recognize as Hugh Normus in Wizards of Waverly Place. He's also Jacob Ben Israel in Glee. And he's a working actor who's been in a lot of things. Hugh Normus is like he's he's the giant that's human sized and he's like, No, all my things are little so that I feel like a giant. It's a blizzard blizzard in Boston. Schools are closed for the day. De- Day and so Zach and Cody are like causing mischief around the hotel. They're bowling with like the little shampoo and conditioner bottles, and they hear some like old school mobster type voices from a guest room. So they both like go up to listen and eavesdrop, and they're like, huh? They're unsure based on what they hear. And so the same guests come downstairs with a giant ass duffel bag that looks like a body bag. And they ask to dispose of the content, preferably in the hotel furnace. And Zach and Cody are like, these guys are hitmen. We overheard the conversation. And they go around telling everyone those guys are hitmen, not to be trusted. That is a body in that bag. But then they speak up and they're like, no, we're just TV writers. (laughs) and so which like still what are i guess they're disposing of old scripts was the only thing i could think of it's also such a random disconnect (laughs) like why did we have to think they were hitmen before we knew they were tv writers but continue sorry (laughs) yeah very confusing um they get inspired to start writing a tv show based on the tipton and zach and cody's lives and literally they like go away and then two seconds later they're like we sold the sitcom which i'm like I'm not in the industry, but pretty sure that's not how that works. And also, don't think that this is how this works, but they're like, we're going to cast actual actors, but you guys are all welcome to come out to Hollywood um, to be advisors. And well, so, only we'll consultants. Their way. Yes. That's the part that made it feel realistic, is they had to pay their own way there. Sure. So they take London's private jet to Hollywood and they check into the Tipton in L.A., which looks exactly like the one in Boston. And then they go and visit the writers and they work in this like basement copy room. And then they interview everyone and all the interviews are mediocre, but they really hit it off with Zach and Cody. They're like chuckling, cracking up, hearing all these crazy stories um, of all their different shenanigans. And then the next day they meet the actors um carrie meets hollywood carrie who's only 22 years old and she's like how old is this woman what the heck are we doing hollywood london is madrid who we mentioned um who's a boy and london's like what the heck and they're like oh the you know the network wanted there to be romance between the candy counter girl and the heir um and which i'm like wouldn't it be more enticing if that was two women and we had romance i thought that was a very interesting choice but we'll get into that the network executives are on set and they're doing rehearsal i don't think they're actually like filming yet but maybe they're um but they're on set and after the first scene they end up firing the boys that were hired to play zach and cody because they just don't really like them and they think they're just way too young 
And then they see Zach and Cody kind of goofing around set themselves. And they're like, you know what? We want to hire those boys. And so they offer the job up to Zach and Cody, but Carrie kind of has some like concerns and hesitations about it. And that is the end of our part one. So Mm -hmm. they fly Tipton Air and it's a bright pink jet with London's face plastered all over the tail of it. Yep. It's the most obnoxious thing I've ever seen. Mm hmm. When they get into L.A., I could go off for like 10 minutes on all of this L.A. stuff, but we don't have the time, so I will keep it high level. Um, But it is the most generic shots of L.A. ever. Um, But right when they flew in and we see the giant LAX sign, I was like, oh, my God, my house. Um, And then (laughs) that's why you. No, 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 no. Sorry, because you wrote the note of like, look, my house, the LAX sign. And I didn't make the connection. I thought that was like a quote, like that London said that as if she lives at LAX. And I was no, really I, I live at LAX. <laughs> I know, but I was confused. Um, also, I have to say, they fly into LAX. Then they go to Hollywood. And then they're driving down Hollywood Sunset Strip. They go to the Chinese theater, which that's not weird. That part makes sense, except that they flew in LAX to go all the way to Hollywood. Then they do the Hollywood stuff. Then they go all the way to the Santa Monica boardwalk and the Tipton seems to be on the water, which is so then I'm like, maybe that's why they went back to Santa Monica because the Tipton is on the water. So maybe the Tipton is in Santa Monica. But if the whole point is to be in Hollywood, you would not stay in a hotel in Santa Monica and you also wouldn't fly into LAX to then go to Hollywood to then go to Santa Monica to go back to Hollywood. Guys, we're only talking about like seven, eight, nine miles in all of these drive- drives, but we're talking like an hour and 30 minutes in traffic. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, if you don't know, Hollywood is not by the water. It's not by the water, and it's not really actually by LAX either. <laughs> yeah, no, because airports are typically not built in the middle of cities. Yeah, so that, I was like, this, I knew you'd have consult. Thoughts. Yeah, it didn't make sense. There's a montage of them in a car driving around to all of these places. It's a convertible, and yeah, I knew, I knew that. Jess was going to have thoughts about that. I was watching it, though, and I was just thinking it must be fun for them to film off lot for once because everything else is obviously on on their normal lot and set. It's literally the same exact Tipton set, except the background of the window is different. But I just thought, like, it'd probably be fun unless they just green screened it all, which they very well could have done and probably did. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm thinking about it, it probably was all on lot. Sorry, guys. Well... They were outside. No, but they are outside the studios, though. Yeah. And some of the shots of them, like, on the beach and stuff didn't feel good. Yeah. That's when I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. It actually felt like they were running on the beach, which I'm sure was fun. And it wouldn't be that hard for them to realistically do on a Disney budget. They could do, Mm -hmm. you know, filming at the beach. Yeah. One of the writers, name is Lou, Lou and Bud. Um, And Lou's, like, thing is that he just kisses everyone on the head. Bud's like, why don't you kiss him on the head? And so the boys start like wearing hats because they don't want to be kissed on the head. And that was just a weird choice. Yeah, it is a weird choice. Also, like obviously these actors are different, but the like size and stature and hairstyle of Hollywood Zach and Cody look exactly like Zach and Cody did during that pilot episode that we watched. They're smaller, though. Yeah, they look a lot like the pilot version. Yeah, they're smaller than they are currently in this episode. But the pilot version, I feel like it was quite comparable. I could agree with that. So getting into our quotes at the beginning, when Zach and Cody are telling everyone that the writers are hitmen, they say, they're hitmen. We're hitmen? We're TV writers. We haven't had a hit in years. (laughs) which I enjoyed. And then the next one I enjoyed also came from those writers when they have sold the pilot. They come into the Tipton lobby and say, we've sold Zach and Cody. And Mosby goes, yes! Mm -hmm. Before the Hollywood of it all happens, Maddie is supposed to go on this trip to go like ice fishing in Minnesota or something and she's not Mm -hmm. that excited about it. And London like misinterprets something that Maddie says and she goes, they have talking penguins and you still don't want to go there? (sighs) 
I don't even it's I don't know exactly what it is that she says it has to do with like it's so cold and Minnesota penguins don't even want to go there or the penguins go there and think it's cold or something but I don't know what it is that she says that makes London think that the penguins talk yeah I should have wrote the precursor line but yeah I still was like this is a funny London line also as they're like either preparing to go to Hollywood or something is happening, maybe this is before school was out and they're like preparing to leave, but they're all like saying bye and giving people hugs. And Zach goes back and gives like Maddie a tight hug twice. And Carrie goes, Zach, remember how we talked about people's personal space? And Zach goes, yeah, and I like Maddie's space the best. And normally I don't like these scenes. <laughs> But something about this one was it's really... Cute. It's cute. Yeah. <laughs> I liked it. Yeah, it's cute. It's funny. And I like that there's a nod that Carrie is trying to do her part as a parent yes. and teach about personal space. And then, yeah, I don't know. He, he, he sees you. It's not... Mm-hmm. We don't condone being in people's personal space without their consent. But also, I will yeah. say at this point in the relationship, and even by halfway through season one, Maddie is aware of zach's feelings obviously he's very overt about them and she's she doesn't necessarily entertain them but they do have a good relationship where she kind of like banters back with him a bit and she is like sees him as a friend and like kind of finds these parts endearing you know like she's not like mad that he's squeezing her oh yeah and she didn't seem uncomfortable at all it wasn't like carrie was stopping it because maddie's like what the heck carrie's just like zach come on we talked about personal space (laughs) exactly Speaking of Maddie, when yeah. London is informed that Madrid is a boy so that there could be a romance between the heir and the candy girl, she says, I would never date Maddie. She's not my type. She's poor. Mm-hmm. Which, again, okay, so let's let's unpack this briefly. Interesting choice, right, for them to write in. We wanted yeah. there to be a, a, a potential love story between the heir and the candy counter girl. And then also to have that be the line in response. I was like, oh, so London Tipton is canonically bi. Yes. Yes. Like, that's what that means, is that yes. London Tipton is a bisexual queen. And I do accept her as one of my own. Yes. London Tipton, Tipton is 100% a bisexual queen. And I feel like this is confirming it because yeah that's what she's saying as long as you're rich she doesn't care she's a bicon yeah yeah uh just throw us that bone right don't you and then Mm -hmm. i have literally no idea what this is i think i think me oh wait the boy is running around the set they touch some oh Mm. I know what it is. The vase on the Tipton set goes flying and Mosby's freaking out because of course he is or the and and he they run and they try to grab it but it falls and it doesn't break and he says just like everyone in Hollywood plastic. Mhm. I don't know, I wrote it down didn't like it, didn't love it, didn't hate it. Mhm. Felt some type of way but I clearly have not unpacked those feelings. Yeah. I feel like it's common Like, still a thing that, right, people comment on, like, you know, everyone in Hollywood gets work done and blah, blah, blah. And there's truth to those things. As you should. If it makes you happy, enjoy it. Yes. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't matter. Like, if you're, if you have the money and you're able to do it, then do it. Um, But also, I don't know why we just act like it's just everyone in Hollywood and not that it literally is just a choice anyway. Yeah, like there are plastic surgeons everywhere throughout the country and world. It's not just Hollywood. I could not count the number of filler places in my neighborhood. Yeah, when I lived in Reno, my dentist also did lip filler. Like, and she was a dentist. And that's (laughs) Reno. Yeah. New York has a lot of medical spas, which are just like. Botox and lip injections and stuff. Discord, yeah. Anywho, part two of uh, this storyline, also known as episode 37. We're getting more guest stars. Eddie Mecca as the Western movie director. He mm-hmm. was in A League of Their Own. Mm-hmm. I didn't recognize him at all. I love that movie. Mm-hmm. And he was in Dreamgirls. Mm-hmm. 
We also have Richard Wyden as the security guard for the the Western film that we're going to get into. Don't worry. And he plays Jimmy Starr in Austin and Alley. And I'm so impressed with Jessica for catching this because I didn't. And I love that show. I just watched a two-hour deep dive on it earlier this week. We also have Rick Young as Johnny Vane, mm. who was in Find Me in Paris, Spellbound, and Theodosia. I don't know what mm-hmm. any of those things are. Mm-hmm. Do, do, do you? Um, I'm aware of Spellbound, but I've never seen it. But they are all like popular-ish films, and I think these are all films. Okay, see TV shows. And then the ultimate guest star for this episode, the Veronicas. That's right, mm-hmm. the Australian twin synth pop duo. Mm-hmm. They're in this episode. I didn't remember that, but we'll. Discuss it. A plot. Mm-hmm. So we pick up where we left off. The boys are like super stoked about this possibility to move to Hollywood and be in the show. Carrie's not convinced because she's like, you'd have to make all new friends and uproot our lives again. And like the whole point of what we've been doing the last couple of years is like finding stability. Um, mm-hmm. But they are like, we can make new friends. Like this is a really cool thing. So she does agree. So we get back into filming. Carrie is being overly disruptive on set calling out or cut instead of the director the director's annoyed then while he's being annoyed mosby and london and maddie are all giving their input about like you're not doing this right to their actors and they're just being a nuisance so those three get kicked out you can't kick out carrie because that's illegal these are minors Mm -hmm. but the other three get kicked out now it's the first live taping in front of a live studio audience and Cody is like, wait, people are going to watch this? I can't, I can't do this. I can't, I can't. And he gets really, he keeps forgetting his lines. He keeps messing up. He's a terrible actor. This is why you don't hire amateurs. Mm-hmm. And Zach is like, I could just do both parts, which I thought was a fun <laughs> little nod to the fact that a lot of twins do that. Yep. Keeps not going well. And somehow it devolves into Zach and Cody having a pillow fight on set. And the director's just like throwing his arms up like he can't be bothered anymore. And Carrie runs on set and is breaking them up. And the host tries to buy time with the audience by telling them that they like, can any, does anyone have any talents? And the Veronicas just happen to be sitting in the front row with a guitar. They're not known as the Veronicas. They're just like random quirky guests that are right mm-hmm. in the front row in full makeup with the guitar. And so he's like, hey, why don't you come sing a song? And so they sing a song. They perform a song for the live <laughs> studio audience while Carrie is scolding the boys about how they need to be professional and Zach and Cody get their shit together they apologize to the writers they're like we're ready to do this and they're like we're ready to replace you because these twins are girls they can handle an audience and they have musical talent bye and they're Australian I feel like that was part of it too it was and they're Australian B plot so they all get kicked off we mentioned and then this kind of split spins off into the second plot and so mr mosby goes off on his own to sightsee and london and maddie see johnny vane who um is a johnny depp parody is what uh, amanda wrote which makes sense um but they see johnny vane they're like oh my god we need to follow him and he's going into a sound stage and so there's a security guard won't let him in. So then they see this giant rack of costumes. So in that's so Raven style, they put some on and they sneak in as saloon girls. Um, but they quickly find out that they're not like the actors that are hired to play the saloon girls. They are the stunt double saloon girls. They're told like, you need to fight each other, crash through this balcony and fall onto the ground. And they're like, what? But then they end up doing it. And the, Director's like, that was great, but please wait until I call action next time. (laughs) And they have to do it again. And they continue to do stunts. And they're getting to the point where they're like, okay, is this really worth it just so we can be near Johnny Bane? Like, I think we should just, like, call it quits. Um, And the director's like, for the next stunt, you need to fly through the saloon doors and land in the horse trough. 
and they both are like, okay, this is our moment. We are calling it quits. And then he's like, and then Johnny Vane will kiss you both. And they're like, oh, we're leaving it in. We're going to keep doing this. Um, They do the whole scene. And of course, Johnny Vane comes out and then the director calls cut and brings the actual actors out to finish the scene and finish the kiss. And then security comes in with the actual stunt doubles and is calling them imposters. And so they both get on a horse and carriage to get away from the sound stage. But the horse separates from the carriage. So then they end up just getting like dragged on the floor by the horse out the front door. Bananas. Mm -hmm. Getting into our notes for the A plot. First, before we get into our notes, what are just like overall thoughts? Because this was like a two parter. Completely um, uh, boring. Yeah. I didn't care for it. I only, I didn't remember that it happened. I didn't Mm -hmm. care about it when I watched it now. And I put it on our list because it felt like an important thing because it was a two-parter. They were in a different city and you remembered what it was. So I was like, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's just like as we mentioned like in the risk it all episode and other episodes we've talked about like if sometimes we're like oh my god they packed so much into this episode they could have reduced this down and fit the entire thing into one episode there was a lot of just like filler and like that whole scene of them going around hollywood there was just like a lot of unnecessary stuff that was added that it felt like they were forcing themselves to stretch it out into a two episode when it was completely unnecessary to do so. It felt more important to the studio to make it. And I do kind of like that it's a little tongue in cheek that it's, Mm. they're saying, wouldn't this be so funny if we made a show about this? And that's exactly what it is. Like we're watching a show, you know, it's a little meta, but it's not memorable to me. Mm Mm-hmm. I also think it's weird that it's not the season finale. There's two episodes after this. It feels Mm -hmm. like a big two-parter should be the season finale. Yeah, but I also feel like this wouldn't wrap up a season. Like, I would be a little disappointed if... The the others don't. (laughs) Okay, okay, fair. The two episodes that follow this are terrible and have nothing to do with anything. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it might have made more sense as a season finale then. So, plot notes. Mm -hmm. When the kids, when Carrie agrees that they can move to Hollywood, Mosby cries. He Mm -hmm. literally cries because he's so happy. But he says it's because he's sad. Or someone is like, oh, he's He's actually going to miss us. And he's like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Also, um, we discussed London's and Carrie's actors. We did not mention little side note maddie's actress seems super great in the first episode and in the second episode we find out she's actually a bitch Mm -hmm. and most these is kind of back into our weird stereotyping of black actors and men because at one point mosby's like giving him too much feedback and he tells him to step off And they get a little, like, confrontational. So then Mosby puts on his, like, yo, yo, yo kind of accent. Mm-hmm. Weird little details that I didn't need. Mm Mm-hmm. But London, at one point, when she's giving her notes and being disruptive on set, she tells Madrid that he needs to do hoppy steps. And Mm -hmm. I thought that was really cute because that's how she walks. She just hops around. Mm -hmm. I also like that like when he does like a talk to the hand she's like no it's more like this like all of the direction that she's giving with Madrid Madrid is annoyed like the rest of the actors receiving direction from our cast but Mm -hmm. um, something about the way that London gives it it's just like so in character that it is really funny Mm -hmm. um Zach flirts with the actress that is playing their mom and like as we learn she's only 22 but it's worse than when we see him flirt with Maddie. Like, I didn't like that they... I never liked that they include this shit, but I especially didn't like that they included that. It's so much worse because she is playing his mother. Yes. In 22 versus 15, like, it's still a problem, but it it's... 14. Way, you know. 
They oh, have I meant more. I meant the oh, difference Maddie, between yeah. mm-hmm. 16 then. Yeah. You you wrote like, this is crazy that they're just running around. And it is crazy. It is. Yeah. It's like the middle of a scene and they're just like running around advising all of these actors on how to do their jobs in the middle of a scene. It's like wild. I'm like, no one would allow for this to happen on set. And that's why they get kicked off. But yeah, yeah, it's not why they got brought there. No. I want to know, what is this timeline? You mentioned it in the first part of like how quickly they sell the pilot. But the they sell that pilot while they're still staying at the Tipton, mm-hmm. which very unnecessary, very fast. And then to go from that to we're talking to, for consulting reasons for the writing to we're filming, we're rehearsing, then we're filming. Like, mm-hmm. it's not that fast at all. Well, then they are approved for a studio audience, have a studio audience in, and are actually filming with the studio audience. All in the span of, like, what literally feels like one week. (laughs) Maybe. It has to be, because they're all still there. If it were any extended period of time, the, like, Mosby would, at the very least, would have had to go back. Yeah. It's, it's also winter, supposedly. Like, yeah. it's, what is this, winter break? I don't even think it was a break because the boys were supposed to go to school, but schools were closed because of the That's blisters. true. Which the timeline is very confusing. Yeah, it doesn't of make the sense. the show and of the show within the show, I'm yes. confused. <laughs> yes. They said the live studio audience was 500 people. Yes, they did. It was 50. <laughs> There yeah. were not that many people. It was like the so it was smaller than I think the so random audience that they sometimes would show. Yeah, it was like maybe three or four like uh, bleacher seating style rows. Yes, I want to know who made the choice that every single writer and director in these episodes, whether it's the writers of this show or the director of this show or the one directing the western, is from New York. They all have heavy New York accents. I'm not sure where they're from. Well, I don't know where the actors are from, but they all have heavy, yes. like, Brooklyn accents. Hence the whole, like, mobster hitman thought mm-hmm. in the beginning. And then the other ones do as well. And I was just like, that's weird because um, Hollywood is in California. Yeah, but people, like, move to Hollywood from all over. But, yeah, it is weird that all of them had New York City accents. Yeah. A couple, sure. All of them? Yeah. So, I have a fun fact-ish about this that I saw. It was actually on our Explore page on Instagram the other day. And I was like, wow, Instagram knows too much about what I'm currently doing with my life because it was recommended. The Veronicas were... They gave a little interview talking about how they were told to show up for the shoot by their manager. They were just like, show up for a shoot. And they they didn't really know about the show because they don't have Disney Channel or didn't in Australia. Mm. And their manager didn't give any real details. And then when they were there, Disney was like, we want you to perform. But also, we don't have the rights to any of your music because it's all like Warner or something. So that's why they a song called Cry because it was an unreleased song. They only had a couple that like were not already on albums. Otherwise, they would have sang Forever or Untouched, which were both from yeah. this era. And I just think that's so hilarious because like, imagine if they had. Disney would have been like, who are these girls? This is not an appropriate song, especially Untouched. This, yeah. this is, they are not a Disney group. Was I listening to them in 2007? Yes. Did I remember mm-hmm. they were on the Disney channel? No. Could I have found them from this episode? Potentially, what I do know is I was very into their music. I have one of their albums. I think they're great. I feel so untouched and I want you so much on The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. Yeah. Are you kidding? And also, what in the like cheap ass decision making to be like, we want you to perform and we won't buy the rights for any of your music? Yeah. It makes no sense, especially because, like, 
yes, maybe the budget wasn't that high, but the show had money at this point. It had viewership. It was very successful. They could pay for some music rights. Like, yeah. And they still haven't released that song or performed it again, I don't think. Mm. Makes sense. B plot notes, just a couple quick ones. London and Maddie are like doing the stunt and the director calls action. And then he's like, okay, now fall on the horse trough. Now flop off into the mud, flop, flop. And like, if he called action, it would be quiet on set. He would not be then shouting additional directions on him. And to them. further that, he, yeah, he talks them through everything. They ask questions. They're not in character. And then after every take, he says it went great. And I'm so confused. Like, yeah. it didn't go great. You didn't get the shot because you were talking. <laughs> the whole time and having a conversation. And they weren't in character. Yeah. Confusing. Was very confusing. Very, very also, this whole time they're pretending to be stunt doubles, which then begs the question is, did they hire stunt doubles to be stunt doubles for them being stunt doubles? But I, I didn't do research to figure out if that was a thing. So sorry, no answers there. But they're pretending to be stunt doubles this whole time. But then when the horse drags them away, they couldn't afford to pay stunt doubles for London and Maddie. And instead, it's like big stuffed versions of them, like stuffed animals. <laughs> Like, London and Maddie being dragged away. And I'm like, this is stupid. I don't think I noticed that. <laughs> I watched it three times. It's so dumb. Why'd we do that? The whole like thing giants? is about... It's and like stuffed clearly... dolls? Yeah. <laughs> stuffed dolls. <laughs> but like, human size. Human size. But, like, it's not... You know, like, the way that a stuffed doll is, like... It doesn't have the rounded edges and the look of skin. Like, it looks like fabric that, like, someone put stuffing into. Like, it it doesn't look like a body. For some reason, it being life-size makes it worse. <laughs> sure. I love and hate that at the same time. I hate the movie, Western movie. I don't know what the premise is, but I know that there are two saloon girls that are fighting over this guy and they both get to kiss him because the more the merrier. And I wrote that it's a Johnny Depp parody. I don't know that for certain, but that's mm. my interpretation because he looks and sounds kind of like him. You don't get to see his face. You just get to see his like hair and demeanor and he seems kind of like early pirates Johnny Depp. And that was my uh, theory from the previous Orlando Bloom references as well was like it's 2007 and like it was weird and I don't like mm -hmm. that this seems to just be about women throwing themselves at this man and that he is mm -hmm. the prize because women you are the prize don't you ever let a man confuse you don't you forget it. And also, I remember at this time, like, classmates in middle school being obsessed with Johnny Depp. Mm -hmm. And, like, I always thought it was creepy. Always. Like, oh, now, really? now I think he's a piece of trash. But before we knew what we know now, I just thought it was so creepy that these, like, 13-year-old girls were lusting after this, like, 40-year-old man. Yeah. It is icky. And even, like, those saloon girls are young. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, what is that? And like, I don't know. This felt like Disney like playing into that a little bit. I don't want yeah. them to play into it. It's already icky. Yeah. They do all the time though. Like there is so much so flirting much, like, with people that are way too old oh. for. Yeah. Yeah. They really didn't care about ages on this show at all. No. No. Okay, um, quotes. Kind of a quote, but um, Carrie is going – yes, kind of a quote, kind of a note. Um, Carrie is going to give the boys, like, a little kiss before they're about to um, call action on their scene. And they're like, no, Mom, we're wearing makeup. And she's like, not really the phrase you want to hear from two teenage boys. And I just don't know why they wrote her character this way, but – any time the boys say or do something that is remotely considered feminine, which, like, makeup is not femininity 
but it is considered something feminine um, in society. She like always has these like apprehensive thoughts and expressions towards it. And it's so annoying to me because it's like, they're actors. All actors wear makeup. Also, you're a lounge performer. You probably put on a ridiculous amount of makeup every night to go and perform. And you're going to have this sort of thought of like, oh, don't want to hear that from my teenage boys. Like, who is it hurting? Yeah, I understand that makeup on boys is still not super normalized. And particularly was not then because I think it really came about more as we became more fluid with gender and also the rise of K-pop. I think they both contributed to us like Mm. accepting men wearing makeup more often in the last five to ten years, especially the last five. Yeah. So I I understand the like, oh, it's weird that like these teenage boys are wearing makeup. But I don't – I agree with like her reactions are unnecessary because she could just be making jokes like – commenting about how oh yours looks more natural than mine does or like some sort of like play off of her experience with makeup rather than yeah oh i don't like Like, that on my son wouldn't want to smudge it or like you know like there are Mm -hmm. because right i could touch it up for you yeah like there are different things she could have done instead of being like you didn't want to hear that from two teenage boys like what yeah it is unnecessary and this isn't that we've had like a scene with a dress where she made a comment or a skirt. Zach was in a skirt. So it's like, uh, yeah. It was I just the, the pageant episode. The very mm-hmm. first episode. Yeah. Tyresha. I wrote down one quote. I don't know if Zach says it or Cody, but it's while they are fighting on set during the live taping. One of them says, when the jerks of the world meet, you're their king. Mm-hmm. And I liked it. And that's it. That's that's the sweet life goes to hollywood guys did you enjoy it would you watch their show would you watch this show those are those are my questions so any other final thoughts unless you had something else to say or do you want me to do my shout outs you can do your shout outs but i have a couple quick ones in the shout outs to add on this time um in episode 27 Ah, Wilderness, we get a guest star of Tom Poston, who plays Merle. Um, He's a huge actor, so I thought I just had to mention it. Mostly in, like, the 1950s through the 80s. But, like, he was on over a thousand episodes of one show. So we may not recognize a lot of the stuff, but he is, like, a huge, huge, huge actor. But he also was on Princess Diaries 2 and Christmas with the Cranks. What show was it? I'd have to go. I didn't write it down. It was like literally from like 1962 or something. <laughs> I'm just surprised that there's a show that had that many episodes. It's got to be a soap. Oh, it has to be. Don't you think? I'm like, do we even make um, it's like a days of our lives type of. Yeah. Like, do we even make TV shows that go on that long anymore? Like, I highly doubt it. It was called Hawk and Falls, a television novel. Oh, I haven't heard of that. I do, now that I'm reading this, I do recall him in The Princess Diaries, too. Mm -hmm. Now, Amanda is going to go into her shout-outs of notable episodes that we didn't cover, little things that she just wants to touch on. So, we will be having another episode after this that is covering three more episodes from The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody Season 2 that are more civil rights based for lack of a more creative way to phrase that but rounding out the rest of season two i want to shout out episode 33 miniature golf so i almost made us watch it it involves cody and barbara's first real date cute it has a shitty c plot of carrie dieting and everyone restricting her sweets all the time Mm. and more importantly we meet london's friends for the first time we like see them as opposed to hearing about them her like heiress friends so chelsea brimmer is one of the characters that appears in three episodes of the sweet life of zach and cody and one episode of sweet life on deck she's played by Brittany curran who is a working actress she's been in other stuff but nothing super duper notable um chicago fire was the most consistent recent one And then her friend Tiffany is played by Alexa Nicholas in two episodes of this show. And she is 
infamously Nicole from Zoe 101 has yep. spoken very outwardly about her experience on that show. Mm-hmm. Episode 38, I Want My Mummy, you wrote down, is um, Phil Lewis, dire- Mr. Mosby. It was his directorial debut. I will shout that out and also say it's a bad episode. <laughs> and I, not his fault, it's the writer's fault. Yep. Episode 38, 39, I mean, is the final episode, and it's aptitude is what it's called. So I wanted to shout out that's a little trope time. Once again, we get a career aptitude test. It's not in school this time. They choose to take it on the internet. Both of those episodes, I Want My Mummy and Aptitude, have very weird cultural notes that made me see the vision of how Sweet Life on Deck got pitched, though, because I Want My Mummy is like they stole a mummy from Peru, and Aptitude has this whole like Moroccan ambassador plot line Mm. where Patrick ends up wearing these puffy pants and for most of the episode and it made me realize like how much more problematic the Sweet Life franchise might get I'm like I feel like I feel like they really said tourism means we can teach the kids about other cultures and that is beautiful and I do love it I'm just cautious about how they go about it and I don't think they ever were cautious yes nailed it so that is it for this. Yeah. Up next. So, so excited. We are getting into Young Royals. We're going to be taking just a brief little pause on Sweet Life, but don't worry. We're going to get back into the content with Sweet Life and finish off um, the rest of season two and season three. But we are taking a little break. We're going to Young Royals to um, align with the season three premiere. Um, So our next episode will be Young Royal Season 1, covering the first half, Episodes 1 through 3. So if you are into our gay content, our remix content where we're reviewing newer shows, give this one a listen. Also, if you have not watched Young Royals and you are into Heartstopper, go watch Young Royals now. It's so good. Um, And we are very excited to talk about it. Um, As always check us out on our social media interact with us comment dm we love chatting with you all and we love hearing your perspective on all of these shows that we cover um we are 90s babies nostalgia on instagram and youtube spell out the word 90s um we also are on tiktok but use the numbers there and then if you want to follow us on twitter um we are 90s underscore babies And please take the time to give us a review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. It really, really helps us. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you're enjoying this. We hope you enjoy Young Royals. And we will be back in April with the rest of our Sweet Life content. But um, I hope you are all doing well. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.